Hello and welcome to New Toy Tuesdays, an occasional look at something flash and whizzy that has plopped onto my tabletop. Uh, this particular tabletop being a whopping 59 Celsius in today's record temperature sun, which is why I'm in my garden with a cool beer and not out on the van. They say mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun, and they're not wrong. Well, you have to take advantage of those too few times the sky is blue. But don't worry, electrical waffling is afoot. And today it's a Mega MPU 690 variable voltage proving unit I should be playing with. Oh, Jesus. Ooh. Crikey, I've had to come in, it's all too hot out there. Mind you, it's 33 in here and uh, a bit messy. I've not been prepared for this. Excuse me a moment. I must have run out of booze last night and hit this. That's a bit weird. Anyway, a bit of space so that we can have a look at this thing. I uh, snapped this up from Edmondson's after popping in there to buy some armoured cable. Curse you and your bloody point of sale tactics. I already have a proving unit, the Martindale PD240 that I bought 10 years ago. Well, I never really used that. So why would I want to splash out about 80 quid on this thing? Well, that's the key question my accountant wants an answer to because the business bank balance is tanking thanks to holidays, Covid, numerous visits to the hungry horse during work hours and our general skiving under any excuse. As indeed we are today, as I've already said. Anyway, I picked this up yesterday as I was interested in the claims on the box of multi-voltage operation. Five stepped nominal output voltages, it says there. 690, 400, 230, 150 volts and that it has a high wattage output for driving high loads. Hmm, we'll come back to that as we try it out on a few voltage indicators. But my original Martindale PD240 I've had since 2012, and that lives in my flute box alongside my Metrol NFT. But I've got to admit, it doesn't see a lot of use. It looks great on my NIC EIC inspection, but when I use a voltage indicator, I usually prove it on a known good source. If I prove at all. Yes, yes, I know, it's very naughty to say that, and I certainly don't want to lead any of you youngsters astray with my bad habits. Nonetheless, I don't always do everything completely by the book. Who does? That's not to say skipping steps is excusable, but I take responsibility for my own actions, and I accept that it's my ass if I cock up. Hence the state of this TIS-845 instrument. Yes, that's 16 millimetres of exposed probe tip right there, which will have the academic viewers in a fit of palpitations, because Health and Safety Guidance Note GS38 likes to see only 2 millimetres of shiny metal, and wholly waves the naughty sick at anything over 4 millimetres. Which is dumb as all shit, because 2 to 4 millimetres ain't enough to satisfy anybody! Like a drunk boy at the bar Maybe you should skip the bit beyond this runs and rave Because it just gets tedious listening to Tay once you stick the GS38 shrouds onto an instrument such as this, it all but becomes unusable. I would demonstrate that, but I can't find the damn things. They've obviously been lost since they were last affixed during my 2021 NIC EIC assessment. I can show it on a multifunction probe though. If we place it on there, there we go. Can you see that? Look at the exposed metal on that, it's fucking useless. The shroud stops it penetrating into some terminals. And the tiny tip doesn't always penetrate to live metal. As it gets lost in the recess of something like a screw head, meaning you're not sure if something is testing as dead or if the bloody probe just hasn't made effective contact. And that's the trouble with GS38. It over nanifies things to the point where it's either no longer fit for purpose, as you can't get your voltage tester into the thing you want to test. Or you think you've tested something as dead, when it's still very much alive, but you fail to make satisfactory contact. It's like the HSE felt they couldn't trust dumbass qualified electricians with more than 4mm of probe tip for fear we'd all be killing ourselves. I suppose their argument is that not everyone using these things are qualified electricians. But why do we all have to dumb down to a lowest common denominator and to a point where we all end up with something so overprotective it ultimately becomes self-defeating? because they tend to get ripped off in frustration. I don't use my GS38 shrouds. And look, I haven't killed myself yet. Maybe I will one day, but I like to think I have enough mouse about how I approach my work 
that I could be trusted with more than four fucking millimetres of exposed tip. Without any plastic shroud, these pointy things get to where I want to stick them, and I get to see whether something really is dead or alive. I was given this TIS-859 some time ago, and there's another new Toy Tuesday from back in the day about it, where I no doubt went through the same rant before, but nothing ever changes. Anyway, they at least tried to address the issue with this model by installing retractable foreskins. At first, I thought that was the bee's balls, and the 859 went into my hip case as the instrument to hand while I go about my day. And yes, I do always wear a voltage tester about the hip. But after a few months, I found that even these retractable foreskins were giving me the arsehole. Let's take fuse testing, for example. See how easy it is on the 845? And how much fiddlier on the 859? Come on. Come on. God damn it. Son of a bitch. There we go. When I saw the TIS rep at a wholesaler open day a couple of months ago, I said, you do know what people do with these retractable shrouds, don't you? And he replied, yeah, they cut them off. Sure enough, I noticed Nick and Adam, who also have the 859, had circumcised their foreskins after presumably one frustration too many, and so they can circumvent the over-restriction GS38 places upon the use of this equipment. It is, again, another industry annoyance dreamed up by a committee of shirts who don't use these things and have never bothered to field test whether their great ideas would prove practical out in the world. And because they don't, my voltage indicator of daily choice went back to being the 845 with the shrouds removed. Because it works, and I can use it competently, being as I'm not the complete fool HSE assumes. Although when it comes to my next NIC assessment, I'll have to be seen using the 859 as at least I can't use the stupid goddamn shrouds off this one. But yeah, GS38 is up there on the gets on my tits list, along with people who walk down the street holding their phone limp-wristedly while talking on speaker, those dryline boxes builders buy because they're 5p cheaper than an Appleby, even though they take an extra 20 minutes to fit because the screws push the tabs in, assholes who FaceTime while walking up and down supermarket aisles, people who write a lot as though it's a real word, civilians who stand at tool station or screw fix counters asking moronic questions about plumbing parts instead of looking up what they need from the fucking catalogue, dog owners who let their pets scrabble at your trousers when you walk in and say, oh he's just being friendly, while I want to scream, stop your fucking animal from clawing at my bollocks, <sighs> and Nigel. Yes, it's that bad. That's the list of company it keeps. And it's bad that it never gets addressed and that I have to pretend to be a good boy whenever my assessor is around so that I can collect a pat on the head and a good effort sticker. But this is supposed to be a video about my proving unit. Yet I've had to include that rant again because complaints will otherwise be received about the long length of my probe and about the missing shrouds on my voltage tester. <laughs> Okay, let's get on with the damn thing. The Martindale is a fine device, however this model is limited to a 240 volt DC output. Let's run it through these instruments to see how it behaves. On the TIS845 we get an audible warning, along with the correct LED indication and voltage reading. Maybe damn it anyway. We get no rotation display because it's DC and sure enough if we reverse polarity on here we should get now a negative voltage reading. Marvellous. Let's try the TIS-859. Friggin' shroud's getting in the way again. But we have contact. Uh, so it's the same as before, with, but uh, we now have a DC indicator on the display and a green indicator at the bottom showing it's a positive DC voltage. Reversing the probes should give us a negative DC voltage. Oh, it's all a bit fiddly this. You've got the camera in the way. Then in there. Uh, yeah, we've got the green light is opposing now and we have a negative DC voltage indicated on the LCD display. Lovely stuff. Uh, the A59 vibrates instead of audibly sounding and it will continue to operate basic display features of voltage even if the batteries are flat. But these fucking shrouds even here are still getting in the way. The Martindale Classic. 
Oh yes. This will show, if I shove it in here, the 50, 100 and 200 volt indicators and a light showing positive indication, again because this is DC. And if we reverse it, hopefully we'll get a negative indication. We do indeed. By the way, uh, I've, sh crikey. I've shown this instrument before. This has locking shrouds, but they're also spring loaded which helps it to get into holes other indicators cannot reach. Although I tend not to use it because if I'm going to carry an instrument on my hip, I prefer one that does at least continuity and resistance too. Finally, last but not least, this fella, the cycling test lamp sent to me by Dave in Portland and rated up to 500 volts. If we stick that in there, oh, come on, get contact. So we'll be having a bit of trouble getting contact with this one. What the fuck is going on here? There we go. It's about as basic as they come, this one. And you can still get them. And although the lamp itself isn't illuminating, the neon is. I expected the lamp to light, but maybe the Martindale doesn't have the minerals for it. Uh, reverse polarity on this one. Again, same thing. Neon lights lamp doesn't okay fair enough there's no point trying this on the Hayoki because that only does ac not dc so a limitation of this proving unit is that we can't check operation of this meter but i guess if you mainly work single phase the pd240 does the doings of proving your voltage indicator is operational or not at least up to that voltage and as a dc test it takes a 9 volt PP3 battery and I presume uses a DC to DC converter to ramp that up to 240 volts. The Mega MPU690 weighs more than the Martindale thanks largely to the 6 AA batteries. Yes, I did say 6 AA's. Thinking about it, 6 times 1.5 volts is 9 volts, so I wonder why they didn't just use a single 9 volt PP3. Oh well. Well, whatever, the box claims it steps through the voltages, and this time on an AC output, which is perhaps handier, as that's generally what we'll be using our indicator devices for. So a proving unit that puts them through their paces ought to be a good thing. Let's spit roast its two holes with the pointy ends of the 845 and see what squirts out. Okay, I'm reading over 700 volts here, but that gets the instrument off the top end of the scale. It's dropping down 400, 250, oh, Jesus. Slow down, Tex. Is it me or was that a bit rapid? Let's just try that again. Okay, 770. And the proven unit's dropping down to 400, 230, one, uh, uh, uh. That's fast. <laughs> The display on this indicator does lag a little, I find, but it really shows here as it hasn't caught up by the time the proving unit has moved down to the next voltage. I guess we were seeing the LED indicators all illuminate and they do turn off one by one. It's just that it would have been nice to see a slower step down so that one has time to visually verify it all before it disappears. OK, let's try the 859. Friggin' shrouds getting in my tits again. Get in there. Okay, once again we have a. Oh, it's. Yeah. <laughs> that LCD just can't keep up at all, can it? Let's do that again. Yeah. It's, it's okay when it gets it on that top voltage, but the, the remaining ones just drop down a bit rapid like. I don't have a chance to read the displayed voltage, so I'm just going by the LED indicators disappearing one by one, which is perhaps all you really need to know, I suppose. The Martindale isn't made for over 400 volts, so hopefully we won't blow it up. There we go. You can see, you can probably see on the camera the AC lights flashing. I can't actually see them flashing on, on the display here. But I can see on the camera screen that they're sort of alternating, showing we do have an AC pulsing waveform. It's supposed to be at 50 hertz, this thing. Again, I'm having trouble getting these becking probes where they need to be. Let's try retracting them. 
There we go, we get the high end, and then once it passes the 400 volts, it just sort of drops off really quickly, doesn't it? Should do one more of those. So it starts off nice and high, and then rapid succession, isn't it? We'll try the cycling next. This should be interesting. Ah, look at that. The, the tester can't get past the 400 volt indication, but the lamp on the cycling is illuminated and does dim as it goes down. That's probably the impedance of the, uh, the lamp on this thing, which is stopping the uh, proving unit from getting where it wants to be. But at least we're seeing the lamp in operation on this one, which you weren't seeing before, we were only seeing the neon. Certainly the Cyclim is more power hungry than the electronic testers, but it seems to do better on the higher rated output of the Mega over the Martindale. There's also a bit of audible noise from the proving unit, which is more noticeable when using the silent Martindale and Cyclim. I'll tell you what, I'll, if you, I don't know if the microphone's really picked it up, I'll move it near the microphone and do a test on, on this one so that you can hear it. Hmm. I assume in this thing we have something to invert the DC to AC, then a transformer to ramp it up. I wonder if it's charging a capacitor too. Old people like me will remember the uh, Xenon camera flashes that used to emit a high-pitched whine as they charged up. So maybe that's what we have here. I wonder too, if it is a capacitor, then a capacitor discharging might explain the quick drop-off at the lower voltages. If that's the case, this isn't really a stepped output as the box claims, more a deteriorating output as it discharges across the instrument under test. I suppose we can test that using the old Hayoki Koki here and we'll see what that makes of it. Because if this were a stepped output, uh, maybe tap-offs on a transformer or something like that, I might expect to see the needle start high, then drop and hover uh, at each rated output. Let's put that somewhere where you can see it and zoom in a bit. If it's a capacitor as opposed to something like a stepped output on a transformer, then I would expect to see a more linear sweep as the uh, as the thing goes down. But uh, at least I think that's uh, the case about I'm not an electronics boffin, so I don't listen to anything I say. Uh, the Hayoki has a voltage setting, but that's only there if you want to use the backlight feature. Uh, with the selector in the off position, this baby will still show a voltage, so it doesn't need batteries for that function. Uh, this is rated at 600 volts, and there is a danger I could damage it if I try to mechanically force the needle off scale for too long. So I'll kick off the test, and I'll reinsert the probe when the MPU drops from the peak output. Okay. Give it a moment. And there we go. That looks pretty linear to me. Should we try that again? Just waiting for it to drop down a bit. There we go, it's starting to drop. Yeah, look at that. Oh, I do like the sexy sweep of that needle. I think I may have mentioned it before, but I find this a really pleasing little fella to have about the toolbox. I digress, however, and what we saw there was undoubtedly a constantly degrading voltage, and not what I'd hoped for, which is a true stepped output, delayed for just long enough at each range that you could verify the reading. Mega's blurb does indeed state that after a short period, it slowly ramps down through each voltage step until the device switches off. But I wouldn't describe what we're seeing here as a slow step down. And again, maybe it works better with mega voltage indicators over other makes. Martindale recommends you marry their proving units with their indicators. So maybe this is impedance matched for a mega voltage indicator and doesn't work so effectively with other brands. Perhaps. But when you consider some of these models are surely rolling out of the same Shenzhen factory, albeit in differing colours of plastic, well then I'm not so sure. There's not much else to say about the MPU690. It's got a magnetic base, so you can stick it onto your distribution board, and the box claims 500 tests for the batteries. But then the box also says it has a stepped output voltage, and that seems to be bumhole talk. I think I'd like to have seen an upper limit selector so you could max it out at 400 volts for instruments that don't support the 690 range. 
and if you haven't got a proving unit it's a good idea to have one not least so you can pull it out on assessment day along with your GS38 shrouds to earn that sticker and this one does do more than most do check the top end of your voltage indicator though if it's 400 volts then plopping it onto a plus 700 volt regularly may not do it any favours it is a charge me 70 quid x vat same price as cef amazon have it on at 95 plus vat at the time of recording so despite the affiliate link in the description i'd check your local wholesaler for pricing if i were you all in all it's not bad and i'm happy to have it in the toolbox but i'm ultimately disappointed that it didn't live up to the claim on the box which is what sold it to me oh nearly eight o'clock and the, uh, the weather's broken in fact i wouldn't be surprised if we had a bit of a a thunderstorm we had just had a, had a shower still it's cooled down chilled beer still i had to do a few beer shout outs first of all thank you to uh, ben at robinson electric apparently i ignored a message of yours i'm sorry about that uh, was that on instagram or something i'm not very good with instagram never could get my head around that i do not understand why that's a popular thing at all but uh, yes, my apologies, Ben. But thank you for your uh, contribution. Uh, oldest apprentice in the northwest, once again. Uh, best real electrician on YouTube. Uh, you probably mean Nick Bundy. Uh, <laughs> he says he likes Nick, really. We all like Nick, really, don't we? Hello. <coughs> There's a fat cat there. You can look at her. She's probably glad that the weather's uh, changed. Who'd, who'd wear a fur coat on a in weather like this? Andy Karush, once again, <coughs> one of our reg regular Andys. I've still got this cough. Enjoy your beverage, chaps. Well, there's only one chap here, and I ain't getting any. He hasn't done anything, has he? Lazy bastard. Test gear junkie in freezing Aberdeen. My thanks to uh, Ria and Sammy up there who uh, are into old testers and would like to see something on the 1741. Yeah, it's an interesting one, that isn't it? Um, as you say, John Ward's done stuff on the 1741. Uh, you see it on eFix's channel a lot as well. I have got access to one because Nigel's got one. Uh, never really played with it personally, but maybe we should get Nigel to blow the dust off it and to bring it in and have a bit of a play with it. Uh, and this just in, just like now, this evening, uh, Stephen Pullman uh, over in uh, Liverpool. I understand you've sent me an email, Stephen. I'll have to have a look at that when I finish messing about with this video. This is all being done today uh, for upload today. It's 10 to 8 and I've still got to do all the rendering and get this tacked on to the end and all that kind of stuff. Logistical nightmare. What a waste of a lovely hot day. Uh, super thanks to uh, Michael Costello in Sydney. Oh, you must know Jim Hook if you're in Sydney. I'm sure it can't be that big a place. Oh. I'm annoying next door's dog. And uh, Brian Wren. Oh. Uh, Brian oh. Wren. Brian Wren. Oh. <laughs> Brian Wren. Oh. Brian Wren. Oh. <laughs> Brian Wren, who has donated half a cup of coffee and a share in a Scotch egg. Thank you, Brian. It was a very tasty. It wasn't a tasty cup of coffee, actually. I'll tell you what it was. I went to Asda, had my one pound fifty cup of coffee yesterday, and the milk had curdled. So technically, yeah, your coffee contribution got wasted. Sorry, Brian. But, uh, thank you all for uh, donating. Tell you, cats and dogs at this end. <laughs> 